Hello, and welcome to the Path of Most Persistence. This is a place where we hear and share tenacious stories of overcoming obstacles with our partners who dare to share a bit of their own personal paths. Joe Sharon started his first consulting firm at the age of 25 to help tech entrepreneurs raise money, grow, and retain their teams in the Boston area. He has helped raise millions of dollars in venture capital financing. Joe is a thought leader and a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. In 2016, Joe's life changed in an instant. When a swimming accident left him paralyzed from the neck down, he is now helping others through his peer mentoring, producing, and hosting a podcast and coaching executives who are facing adversity themselves. He is driven to one day walk again and return to work, helping entrepreneurs achieve their goals. Joe, it's so great having you on today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me as a guest. Absolutely. Um, I think one of our mutual friends, Charisma Jackson, had mentioned you uh, in a conversation and she, you know, she mentioned that you would be a wonderful person to have on our podcast. And, and I have to tell you, um, I, in my research and studying up, Joe, your, your background is truly um, impressive and impactful. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, Charisma is a rock star, and uh, me, myself and my wife love her dearly. dearly. She is amazing. And, and I'm just wondering if, if you would like to start, where would you like to start? Would you like to start at the point of which your life changed, or would you like to talk about that life before, that life-changing moment? So my life um, before the accident um, was just your your typical living the dream, you know, working really hard, achieving goals, um, working with others, helping others. And then it changed in an instant. Um, I was on vacation in Mexico, myself and my wife, Michelle, and uh, Charisma and her husband, Tim, were actually there. We had met them years before in Cancun and we returned, tried to return every year to get together uh, with a small group of us that became friends over the years. And we were at the pool and at the beach that day. My wife went up to the spa to um, actually just get a massage. And at that point I had um, decided to go back into the water for one last swim and a wave hit me um, and knocked me over onto my neck uh, and actually broke my neck uh, on the sandbar. And unfortunately, nobody saw what happened. So um, I, uh, I, I, I actually stopped breathing immediately because it broke my C3 and C4 vertebrae. And I then began to float uh, down to the next resort, which was the Hard Rock Cafe. And there was a gentleman, luckily, who noticed me in the water. Uh, his name is Fernando. He is from Colombia. And he and his wife pulled me from the water. And the lifeguards began CPR. And after about 20 minutes, uh, the lifeguards gave up. Uh, they didn't think that there was anything that they could do to bring me back to life. So Fernando uh, started to circle my body, screaming and, and crying and asking them to continue. And uh, the lifeguards gave it one more shot and for about 10 minutes continued to do CPR. And at about the 30 minute mark, I came back to life and I was then shipped off to a hospital in Cancun for emergency surgery and then put into a coma, a medically induced coma. And they med flighted me back to Boston. Um, and that's sort of where my second life began. Goodness, thank you for sharing Joe. and. And um, so many emotions, hearing your story, so many emotions, so many thoughts. But I, the first most um, 
I guess the strongest question that I have that really comes to the forefront for me is why, Joe, why do you think you were given a second chance? Or how was it that you were given a second chance? Do you think there was a reason for it? Well, I think I've yet to find the true reason um, as to why God gave me a second chance. Um, but um, I was clearly chosen um, for some reason. And I think that that will be revealed uh, the, the longer I continue to live. Um, but I'm doing my best to try to repay that and help others out and be a mentor and be a, a positive um, force for people who are struggling with their own adversities. I, I think that's amazing. And I think the fact that you are choosing to be so positive and to be a force for good and to make positive change in other people's lives um, d does that come naturally to you or is that something that you have to work toward to be positive and to see the good, to work for the good? Well, before my accident, life was um, quite a bit different. I was stressed out all the time. Um, there were times when, you know, like everybody else, I just, um, I had negative thoughts towards things. I had positive thoughts towards things. I did my best to be, you know, a better person, but that definitely did not come naturally. For some reason, after my accident, um, I, I think that there were two paths that I could have taken. Um, and I refer to it as the red pill or the blue pill. And I took the, the, the correct pill. And, you know, just every day has been um, a positive day. I think, um, number one, I am just so thrilled to be alive today. Um, seeing how close I came to not, I mean, it wasn't a near death experience. It was a death experience um, and how close I came to not being revived on that beach that day. So um, every day when I wake up, um, I'm blessed to be alive. And at the end of the day, I'm thankful that I made it through another day. So, you know, it's just a repetitive cycle of, of positivity and Physically, every day is a complete challenge. You know, the pain is, is sometimes unbearable, um, but mentally, every day has been a very positive day for me. I, there are some that say, and I hear many say, that it's, it's perpetual, either if we use our energies for good or for negative, whatever it is, it just perpetuates it, itself and it strengthens whatever path you've to that you've taken. And you mentioned the two different paths, which we're glad that you're on the path of most persistent today, but uh, you mentioned that the red and the blue. And did you need guidance to get on the path that you're on today? Or is that a decision that you made on your own? Is it a decision you made with your wife? Or, or is it something, again, that just came to you, it was a decision that you just decided with and you, you made it once and it was never something you had to revisit. So I think it goes back to when I was coming out of the coma. I was at Mass General Hospital in the uh, SICU um, the floor. And when I came out of the coma, I did not know what was going on. I really had no idea. Um, I had a sense that I was paralyzed. I had some memories from what happened in Cancun from being in the hospital. Um, but when I woke up, my wife whispered in my ear that everything was going to be okay. So the strength that I witnessed in her at that very moment, um, I think it just sort of flipped a light switch in my head. And it's something that we never had to work on ever again from that point. Um, it's just, Again, taking the, the energy from being alive every day, I'm able to use that and be thankful so that, you know, if negative thoughts come to me, I figure out a way to overcome that adversity. And I do see um, people all the time who are facing adversity, you know, whether it be from a medical diagnosis or an injury or something other that they do go down the other path and it's really difficult for them to recover once they start doing that. Um, so I think early on when 
you know, something happens to a person, that is the best time to um, either start mentoring them or for them to get professional help uh, to be able to overcome that adversity. Thank you, and and I uh, I applaud, and I'm so uh, thankful that you share that, especially about your wife being that support for you. Uh, I think you know so many individuals don't have that support, but for you to have that support, and and that you as you've been recovering and going through all that you've had, that you're choosing to be that support for others, to be that example, and and that's what we again appreciate you being part of our discussion today because we hope that our audiences will be motivated by our conversation and your story because we all need each other, don't we, Joe? Don't we don't we need each other to encourage and to support? We absolutely do, Valerie. I have uh, an enormous support team of loving family members, of friends, people like Charisma and Tim, and um, everybody who helps me for my nurses and my um, home health aides, my physical therapists, my bus drivers who bring me the physical therapy, just they're all part of that recovery team. And I need every single person to be able to help me out. And, um, and hopefully I can pay it back at some point in time and help them if they're ever in need. Well, I'm I'm sure they're doing all that they do out of love and respect and and what their positive light that they are uh, leading and the path that they're taking. But I don't you think too, Joe, and 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 speaking, you know, to uh, your life before and even after. I think for those that assist and support others, there's a level of of lightning. I guess lighting lightning as in lightning the spirit. Uh, so to speak, that is brought about helping others and supporting others. And and do you feel like the work that you're doing now helps in your recovery process in being that for others? Um, I know you want to give back, but doesn't it also do us good by doing good in the world? It's incredibly rewarding um, to be able to help another person out. And I learned so much from the people who mentored me and helped me out. They're wonderful people. And when I can pay that forward or pay it back um, to somebody who's in need, uh, it's very rewarding. And um, people, we all have a story, you know, we all have adversity that we're facing every day. So on one hand, we all need help, but on the other hand, um, we all have so much to give to others. Um, sometimes we get caught up in the work that we're doing and we're stressed out because we're working you know, 40, 50, 70 hours a week at our jobs. Um, but the reality is um, we have a wealth of power and knowledge that if we could only step aside and um, try to find somebody in need to be able to help them I think the world would be a much better place. Agreed, agreed. And I want to, to circle back, if you don't mind, I want to circle back to Fernando, Fernando and his wife. How do you explain them, Joe, being there, him calling, continuing to call for help with such emotion? Or do you think there was some type of divine intervention? What are your thoughts? Valerie, I really think that it's a little bit of both. Um, Fernando and his wife were there on vacation, uh, again, coming from Colombia, and they weren't sure what happened to me. They saw me in the water. They weren't sure if I was snorkeling uh, because at that point, you know, I was lifeless. I was paralyzed from the neck down and, and, and dead, so I was not breathing or moving. And they happened to pull me from the water. And it was actually three years after they uh, hit Fernando himself was in an automobile accident. And he was in an automobile accident with um, one of his sons and his son died. He was not able to save him. Um, and Fernando did not want to see another person die uh, before him. So 
he did everything in his powers to be able to save me. And yeah, that day, if you think about it, he saved my life twice. He pulled me from the waters and then he made sure that the lifeguards did not give up and giving me um, life-saving CPR. And do you do you still keep in touch with Fernando and, and his family? And uh, are, are you still in contact with them? I am through the power of the internet. Uh, Fernando and I uh, connect through WhatsApp on a regular basis. He traveled to the US, we just missed him. Uh, we did not have time to, to book a plane ticket in time to meet him in Florida. But um, next time he comes up here, we are going to get together with him because, you know, as you can imagine, we're pretty motivated to to be able to meet him in person one day. He's a just a uh, he's a he's a lifesaver, and um, he refers to me uh, as as Jesus. He said that he saw me uh, dead on the beach, and I came back to life, and that's something that's changed his life forever as well. He does not know how to explain it. That's amazing. And such a, a wonderful um, connection that you, you both now share that I'm sure will, will only grow. I hope so. And, and those were his words, by the way, not, not my words. I, I don't agree with that at all, but it's just his interpretation of what happened that day. Well, I think that's probably when we find most value in life is when we find a, find connect a value to something. You know, if it's an incident, a situation, when we put meaning to it, because otherwise, what do we learn? What do we receive by that? And I think the more we look to find meaning, the more we look to find purpose, the more we find it, no matter which way you go, if it's pop for positive or for good. I agree, Valerie. Otherwise, you know, what what purpose do we have on this planet? You know, why are we living if there's not, if we're not finding value and, and meaning behind everything that we do? And Joe, what about regret? Do you, what are your thoughts on regret? Do you experience regret? Do you allow yourself to experience regret? I do not. And I've talked amongst my peers who have gone through this and um, I think I am definitely the outlier on this one because they do have regrets about what happened that day. If they had only done this or only done that, um, I cannot change what happened in the past. That is in the rear view mirror. Um, I can only learn from it and try to become a better person. And in some ways, I mean, yes, I'm paralyzed from the neck down and I'm limited to what I can do physically, but um, in some ways or many ways, um, I've, I've, I've had a better life uh, as a result of it. So I do not have any regrets at all. I try to make the most of every day. I understand. And, and I'm wondering as well, on the other side of that, sometimes, you know, when we choose not to regret, when we choose to move forward, it's almost as though that we, um, we can assign a purpose to our accident or the events that happen to us in life, the, the difficult times in our life. Do you think there was a purpose, an intentional purpose, a, a, a pre-assigned purpose for what you experienced? Or do you think, it, again, it was just something that happened and you're moving forward this way because the path you chose? It's really hard to say at this point. It's been five years since the accident. Um, if I had seen some immediate results, like um, being able to solve world hunger or something along those lines, I would definitely think that there was a pre-assigned uh, purpose for what happened, but um, that's yet to be seen. So I'm gonna go with it was just a, a, you know, a, a freak accident that happened, something out of my control. and. You know, we'll wait and see what happens in the future. Yeah, I understand. And as far as, you know, relationships go, I'm just wondering, you know, obviously there's going to be how, um, there's going to be some obvious changes to maybe how we relate, how we maneuver uh, physically, um, 
now prior than than before. But I'm wondering, as far as relationships, have have you noticed a difference in relationships? Because I just think that perhaps when ever any of us have gone through major milestones or ma major events in our lives, sometimes it's almost as if it's a tectonic change or there's a possible change in relationships. And I wonder if you experienced uh, changes for the good or for the bad uh, in relationships. I have. And, you know, for my relationships, many of them have gotten quite a bit better. I think that people have finally taken a, a step back to look at their own lives and realize what they have and look at the adversity that I go through. And for some, um, it has gotten better. When I look at relationships in general, though, I was finding that many of my peers who uh, are going, their relationships have gotten quite a bit worse. So yes, there is a tectonic change, sometimes for worse. And it puts such a strain on your relationships with your loved ones, either a significant other or your children or your family members, that for the majority, um, it ends up in a, unfortunately, a, a, a negative result or a negative outcome. And that's why I started my podcast uh, through Thick and Thin to be able to just help. Our goal is to help just one person that is struggling with their relationships, either someone who's had bad relationships and wants to figure out a way to make them better, somebody that's in a relationship that wants to figure out how to not go down the wrong path, or even somebody who's going to get into a relationship um, has worried if, they're, you know, if they have a disability, if that's going to prevent them from being able to find a significant other. We started the podcast and um, so far we've gotten some pretty good feedback from others who, um, who are struggling or who have struggled and it's helped them out quite a bit. Thank you for mentioning your podcast because I think it's a, a, a wonderful time to pivot to your work you're doing now. So can you tell our audience a little bit more? I, I know you've mentioned it, but again, how long have you had your podcast? What are some of the awarding features that you've learned yourself about your podcast? And I also wanna hear about your peer mentoring and also your coaching. Yes, definitely. So we started through Thick and Thin last year. And the the most difficult part for us was finding couples who wanted to open up over a podcast about the struggles that they have in their relationship. Um, because as you can imagine, not a lot of people want to talk about that. Um, we targeted people who are in a relationship that things are going um, good or better as a result of their uh, medical diagnosis or accident. And it's been really tough finding people who wanna do that, but we've been able to find a few and we started to figure out a way to, as you can imagine, doing a podcast takes a, a lot of effort on the back end. So having to host it and for um, me to produce it has been a bit of a challenge, but we're doing it. And uh, so far, it's been a, a really great learning experience, not only from figuring out how to publish a podcast, but also I've learned so much from our guests who have um, been so generous to donate their time to be able to help others. Um, their stories are amazing. They really are. And so it's, it, the podcast is really about the people that I am interviewing. It, it's not about me. It's really about them and their stories and how they've faced adversity and overcome adversity or, or continue to face adversity. So it's helped me out tremendously and uh, it's helped others who are who have taken the time to listen. And where can any of our viewers find your podcast uh, through Thick and Thin? Viewers can find the podcast on every major platform. Uh, it is a audio only podcast, so we haven't switched over to video yet, but they can find it on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play. They can find it on Spotify, 
I believe it's on Stitcher as well. So all the major ones, Anchor uh, is the hosting platform that's owned by Spotify. So pretty much everywhere. Fantastic. I wanted to give you a, a plug there just because I know how important these types of messages are for those that are going through those difficulties. And, and it sounds like your message in the through thick and thin can reach a lot of people. And I, I hope you the best success uh, in, in reaching the intended audiences. I really appreciate it. I could probably use some tips from you as well as the producer of this amazing podcast to, to help me out with a few things. Happy, happy to help where I can. <laughs> thank you. Joe, thank you so much. And I just want to ask you one more shop question <laughs> podcast before we talk about some of the other things. Isn't it incredible? I know we talk about learning so much from our guests, but it's something about hearing people's voices. Um, I think for me, uh, hearing them express their experiences through their own voice where you can, it, you can not only, well, in this situation where you can see it, but you can hear it and you can almost feel it sometimes. And, and is that, is that a thrill for you as it is as much for us? Because uh, again, I think it's just something about hearing those emotions. It really is because I never know what to expect. Yeah. I don't do any, re you did a lot of research ahead of time on me, but I really do not research my guests. So when I get them live, uh, and they are recorded, but I have them live when I'm doing the podcast. I am sometimes just blown away by their stories and what they're doing, what they're going through and what's happened to them and how it affects their lives and their relationships and their work. And uh, it really is just something to be able to hear their voice and hear it, you know, from, from their own perspective and point of view and sort of put yourself in their shoes for just one minute to see what they're going through. It's, it's a great platform. It is. And, and I, and I love that part in those conversations or those conversations where you can almost when uh, your guest is expressing themselves or saying something and all of a sudden I love to see it when they realize something new about their own stories. Uh, I, I think it's quite common that we have our own stories and we think our stories are, yeah, that's just whatever. I don't, I don't have, you know, I have a boring life. Nothing special happens to me because it's your life. But when our guests are talking about what they feel are ordinary lives, which everyone has something special in their lives, I think it's such a beautiful moment that we capture in these podcast conversations when the guest realizes that there is something special about their experience or their life. I agree completely. You know, people who are going through adversity and um, what they've been able to accomplish and how they've been able to accomplish that is something that has inspired me. Um, every story, I've taken something out of it that's inspired me and made my life better, made my relationship with my wife better. So I am very thankful to others for taking that time to, to be able to help out. Nice. I wanna take one more pivot in regards to your expertise and that's working with entrepreneurs. Um, I, I've always been surrounded by entrepreneurs and I'm always amazed with their gusto. I'm always amazed with their ability to, to do something uh, different, unique on their own. And I'm wondering, what is it about entrepreneurs, Joe? What is it that you find interesting about them? What is it about yourself that drives someone uh, to be an entrepreneur? I am not even sure where to begin with this one, Valerie. There's so much, um, you know, I, I, I tend to gravitate towards those who are extremely well-educated in their field, they're specialists. Uh, they've got just so much uh, raw mental horsepower to be able to attack problems that um, I could only wish to ever have uh, that much brain power at one time. 
Uh, they have a tremendous amount of energy and it is really, it's contagious. Uh, when you find somebody who is really that passionate about what they're trying to do. And um, when I find people like that, it's, it's just, it's not even work at that point. Even when you're doing 60, 70, 80 hours a week, um, it, sometimes it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, you're trying to tackle a problem that's uh, never been done before. We refer to that as swimming in a blue ocean. Um, where you're sort of alone and uh, it's it's scary at times but it's a lot of fun and uh, if you're doing the right thing it can it can obviously pay off quite a bit yeah I think probably if entrepreneurs were given some type of personality quiz I think they would be way out there on those risk-taking sides of the scales for sure it takes a special personality I think to be um, an entrepreneur, it's especially at a certain level. Um, I think at any level for sure, but there's a certain level that really um, seem to just go, just to go for it. And especially in those uncharted waters in an area or to agree that no one around them has done before. I'm, I'm amazed by that. I agree. And there are also entrepreneurs that are extremely um, introverted and smart, and they are not the leader of the company, but they are the leader on the technology side. And I have to look at people on my team and sort of counterweight that and balance it off so that we have people who have the smarts on the business side of things, on the marketing, on the sales side, you know, working with customers, because Sometimes the introverted technology people, they don't want to be the face of the organization. You know, they want to be left in the back room to be able to produce these amazing products. And it does take a team effort. You really have to look at the strengths and weaknesses of each person and then bring in others that are going to um, really complement them so that the company can be a success. And what does that take? What does that take when you're dealing with teams, especially, especially entrepreneurial teams? What does it take to help them identify their team, their teammates, so to speak, their team members that will kind of cultivate a culture that allows for seeing each other's strength instead of it just being competitive all the way around? Because to me, it seems as though that takes a special, special type of culture to let everyone's um, uh, talents and expertise rise, and then also letting them sit back in an area that they don't feel that they can contribute as much. You're right. So when you're working with a, a team, and typically I work with a team when they're small and they're trying to raise that venture capital funding, and they need additional team members to be able to, to balance off their executive team, um, you start at the top and the CEO has to have a belief that transparency is the number one, um, number one thing that we're going to bring to the culture. And you have to have a CEO who wants to have a culture that's uh, inclusive to all, that includes you know, bringing in um, diversity even onto the executive team, because some people like to talk to talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk, as I say. Yes. And they have to be able to do that and they have to be able to spread that message um, as often as they can, that we need a transparent and a diverse and inclusive um, company. And when we're hiring people onto the team and they see that, um, it sort of just self-perpetuates from there um, versus an executive team that does not have an interest in inclusion or diversity, then unfortunately that per perpetuates in the wrong direction and things only get worse over time. And it's awfully hard to, to be able to help those companies out once they grow too large. That is, that is so helpful. And that provides a lot of clarity. And I think too, just for our listeners, Joe, I'm wondering, uh, you know, for folks like us that have been in education uh, for some time, this is the sector, this is the realm that we live in. How does, or, or would you imagine that a sector such as education or 
I don't know, maybe just an, an institution of some sort, if it's an agency or if it's other, some other type of, of business structure versus an entrepreneurial one, what is the major difference? I think at the end of the day, people are people. And you can have amazing ideas and results no matter what the industry is. You just have to believe in the ideas. You have to believe in the people. And you have to give people, no matter what level they are, um, a sense of autonomy. You, know, you can't have this structure where the most senior people are the ones always making the decisions because the people who are less senior are going to lose their belief that they can actually make a difference in that organization. So what I like to say is um, everybody has a seat at the table. doesn't mean that you have a vote on everything, but you have a seat at the table and we wanna hear your ideas because in some of the most successful and amazing companies that I've helped out over the years, uh, we've had some of the newest hires come to the table with an idea that changed everything. So um, no matter what the industry that you're in, uh, as long as you believe in the people and you give them the notion that they can make a difference, uh, it doesn't matter if it's tech or finance or insurance or education. Uh, if you have that belief that uh, transparency is one of your most uh, important assets, for your culture, then uh, yes, you can have an organization much like these tech companies that seem to have these amazing cultures and, uh, and anything is possible. Everybody has to believe that. Certainly your CEO and your executive team have to be the leaders though in that conversation. Joe, those are such, that's such an important message. And I, I appreciate you saying that because it's something that we all need to hear. I think that's um, one of those transcendent core needs that we all have just to be seen and to be valued. And uh, especially I can testify to having a, a great team here on the, the screen that you see. It is important to hear from everyone because everyone brings such a rich perspective and, and it's good to be reminded of that no matter the years of experience, no matter the, the title, everyone has something to contribute. So thank you so much for that, Joe. Oh, you're quite welcome. I, I, I am trying to be respectful of the time. So I want to start winding down, but as I begin to do that, I wanna know from you, Joe, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd really like to address or to mention? during this time? I know that we touched upon it earlier, but um, the peer mentoring is so important um, to people that are facing adversity, uh, especially those whose lives have changed because of an accident or a medical diagnosis, when things do you know, change it at, at an instant, as much as mine did, because I've met a number of people who they, are in the hospital and maybe they're paralyzed or maybe they had a stroke and they've got a family at home and they may be the breadwinner uh, for, the, for the family. And they're going through so much at that time and they just need somebody to reach out and to be able to help them. Uh, so peer mentoring, I think if anybody has a chance to do that, um, it's, it's a really rewarding and satisfying uh, thing to be able to help others. So that's my plug to have everybody go out and find somebody that they can help in life. Thank you. And that is very important to our organization. We try to, uh, especially working with K-12 and, and higher ed, we really try to institute some type of mentoring platform in all of our programming. And thank you for saying that because I think sometimes we forget, we're so focused on providing mentoring to, to young people, which is absolutely critical, of course, but none of us are too old, too wise, too, <laughs> too experienced to, to not need a mentor. I think we all need a mentor throughout our entire life. That's right. And I have learned so much from the people that have helped me out, many of them. Are, I'll give a great plug for millennials because 
uh, I am always blown away at their smarts, their work ethic, and just how much knowledge they bring to the table. I wish when I was their age, I had that much going for me, <laughs> but um, I do give them a lot of credit. And uh, I think often we look at, well, a mentor should be somebody who uh, does have more years of experience or uh, more education, but often we can find just the opposite, that just people who uh, have really good ideas that are able to help other people out, it doesn't matter their age or their um, years of experience. That is so well said. I think for some of the millennials I know, I think what I love most about them, in addition to their excitement and their ideas, but their ability to maneuver between um, uh, situations and, and platforms uh, in some cases, but just that ability to maneuver in uh, different circumstances. So for me, you're right. It doesn't matter their age, uh, their experience. Uh, we're always able to learn from someone. So thank you so much for that, Joe. Um, if you don't mind, Joe, uh, this is something new I've been asking some of our guests to do. It's uh, rapid fire phrases. So uh, what I would like to do is just give you a beginning phrase, and then you can end it. How about that? I will do my best. I'm not great at these, but <laughs> I will do my best. And uh, as long as you promise that it, if it doesn't go well, you will edit me right out of the picture. Uh, again, Joe, you're going to do great. It'll be me that needs to be edited. But listen, uh, I we're all friends here, and I would only set up our guests to do well. But I love these phrases. So here we go. Ready? I believe in. I believe in people. Uh, people have the ability to change this world in a much more positive and better way. Uh, if we could only take a step back to uh, realize what we have going for us in life and look at what we can do, the impact that we can have. And it's not starting tomorrow, it starts today. Um, I often ask people, you know, if, if they're able to change things, um, they say that, yes, starting tomorrow, they're going to start going to the gym or do something different. And I always ask the question, why not start today? Why not do it this afternoon? Today is an amazing day to get things done because you never know what's going to happen at three o'clock today or, or if we're, we'll leave it, wake up and be alive tomorrow. Love it. Okay, next one. I trust. I trust people will do the right thing if given the opportunity. You need to give them that autonomy and let them go and do things on their own. Nice. I love. I love everybody around me, all of my friends, all of my family. They are amazing people. They bring me inspiration every single day. And I am so amazed at the adversity that they go through that um, it just inspires me and motivates me. Nice. I fear. I fear nothing. I've already died once, so I'm still here. So I fear nothing. Amazing. I forgive. I forgive everyone for you know, what they've done. I think in life we have to, we can't hold grudges. It only holds us back in what we want to do. So we have to forgive. Doesn't mean we have to forget. I want. I want those who are suffering to be able to overcome their adversity. I believe in luck, hard work or miracles. I have to choose one of those. No, not if you don't want to. You just you finish that phrase however you'd like. I believe in luck, hard work, in miracles, because any of them can happen at any time, and we do have to rely on all of them. Uh, people don't get lucky in this world. They work hard to get to where they're at, and yes. Some luck does come about, but they don't get to where they're at because of luck. Final one, 
I persist because. I persist because Valerie made me do this on this podcast. (laughs) All right, take two on that one. Um, I persist because uh, it's a wonderful world. It really is. Um, Life is a gift. And I just keep chugging along because I want to live every single day. And I try to live in that moment every day. Um, And I look around and I find the beauty in every day because there are amazing things that happen around us if we just take a couple of seconds to see what's going on in the world. It's, it really is an amazing place. Okay, so star plus, 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 plus. That was outstanding. This is very new that we've added rapid fire. And Joe, that was just tremendous. Thank you so much. For me, you are luck, hard work and miracles personified in a big positive package. So Joe, thank you so much for being with us today. It was simply a joy. Valerie, you're too kind. Thank you for having me as a guest and uh, thanks to your wonderful team. Um, I really am blessed to be here today. Well, As we close out, Joe, again, it was a pleasure. And to our audience, I hope you listen to this entire conversation along with all the other conversations that we've had. And I hope, like Joe said, let's start today. Start today because it is amazing. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye now.